Welcome to That's Good Sports. I am Brandon. I'm in the mood for the Broncos to snap another win streak, Perna. I'm also asking former Broncos punter Marquette King for the opportunity to audition for his next music video. I can do what this guy is doing. This is the Broncos versus Steelers prediction episode where I break down all of the matchups and determine a winner based on painstakingly detailed film review of everything that I've watched on Netflix, HBO Now, and Amazon Prime. That's good sports. Please take a second and subscribe to this YouTube channel. You just click the subscribe button on your screen. It's pretty self-explanatory. Also, I earn a living through Patreon, patreon.com slash that's good sports. So your support there is greatly appreciated. Uh, moving forward, I am uploading videos that have magically disappeared from the internet that will only be available to you on Patreon. A couple weeks ago, I put up the Broncos Super Bowl 48 recap that many of you old school TGSers? What do I call my followers? <laughs> I'll figure that out when I need to become a cult leader. But anyway, I'm gonna put uh, old videos up there for the $5 and above patrons. And again, that's how I pay the bills. That's how I pay Will Keys to help me write some of the episodes and do the podcast. So thank you. On to the review. As is tradition here, the Broncos will start with a half point for home field advantage. The Broncos will also be wearing their color rush uniforms, those all orange bad boys they've worn on Thursday nights the last two years. Not great for camouflage, but excellent for triggering epilepsy or making sure Andy Janovich doesn't shoot you in the wild. DenverBroncos.com did a Madden simulation of the game, which predicted a 17 to 14 Steelers win. And because the game looks so real, uh, Vance Joseph thinks it's already been played and is preparing for the Bengals. Oh. Mike Tomlin versus Vance Joseph. Mike Tomlin is like the older, cooler brother of Vance Joseph. He's got the good music, the cool clothes, the hot girlfriends, all the weed, a letterman jacket, and a state championship ring. And Vance only gets to hang out with him because he's threatened to tell their mom and dad about the abortion Mike made his girlfriend from another school get. Typical teenage Americana story. Now, I'm not sure what Tomlin's specialty is as a head coach. Pretty sure he used to be a kicker before a, a coach, but I trust him to at least try and trip Emmanuel Sanders streaking down the sideline for a score. Half point advantage for the Steelers. Steelers O-line and running backs versus Broncos front seven. Denver averages 125 rushing yards per game. The Steelers with James Conner are only averaging 97.7 yards. Yet as a team, they have the same amount of rushing touchdowns at 13. Lindsey and Conner are probably two of the best feel good stories of the year. And even though their style is different, they're both playing great football. The weird thing is the Broncos refuse to throw the ball to Lindsey more frequently, even though getting him in space would be the best fucking thing you could do for him. Connor, on the other hand, has basically twice the amount of receptions and yards in the passing game. The Steelers line is built to pass block. That's their strength. And that's why they actually run the ball less than you probably think they might. But make up for it by throwing to Connor out of the backfield who has 45 receptions this year. That's more than Cortland Sutton. Since that three week span of hell when the Broncos gave up 121 rushing yards to Kareem Hunt, 219 to Isaiah Crowell, and 208 to Todd Gurley, they have not allowed a single 100 yard rushing performance. So I expect them to do that this week as well. What I'm not sure about is the pass rush against this offensive line. 
which sounds strange to say, with Von Miller and Bradley Chubb playing as well as they have recently. Chubb has six games left to get six sacks and pass Javon Curse for the rookie sack record. If he can sack Big Ben twice, I like his chances at doing that. Denver at home, I will give this unit a half point for the Broncos. Steelers, ball catchers versus Broncos, secondary. Yes, there is a slew of weapons here. Maybe getting less attention because everyone is fixated with the shiny new toys in Kansas City, Los Angeles, and New Orleans. The Steelers are fourth with 312 passing yards per game, fifth overall with 410 total yards per game, fourth in points per game, and have a third best 11 receiving plays going for more than 40 yards. That is one less than the Chiefs, and the Broncos secondary, even when it plays well, tends to give up two to three huge plays in the passing game. That is a concern for me. Last week, in a victory, they gave up 401 air yards to Phillip Rivers. The Broncos did pick off two passes, however. The two things to worry about are not getting torched by Antonio Brown like Chris Harris did in 2015, and not getting stiff-armed into an early grave by tight end Vance McDonald. Vance McDonald, none of the athletic talent that Gronk has, but 10 times the human strength. The Broncos did release corner Adam Pacman Jones this week after Bradley Roby played his best football of the season. Roby has cleared the concussion protocol and should play Sunday. Uh, but should I be worried that Roby played his best football with a concussion? Is that like doing your best parallel parking when you're drunk? If Chris Harris plays slot and shuts down Juju Smith-Schuster, Antonio Brown will fucking obliterate the rest of the secondary. If Chris Harris covers Brown, shuts him down, Juju Smith-Schuster will fucking obliterate the rest of the secondary. <laughs> Steelers get a full point advantage here. Uh, I'm still waiting to see Sua Cravens make a game-changing play for the Broncos defense, and maybe, maybe that happens Sunday. What a bold, bold call out. Special teams versus, uh, special teams? Mike Kliss, Mike Kliss owned us all last week. The call of Wad Mania may go down as the greatest football prediction in NFL history. His fake punt was a thing of beauty. As much as that hyped me up for Wad Mania though, call me old fashioned. I still wish Marquette King was on the team making music videos like the one he dropped a couple days ago. You really have to respect his message for encouraging kids to eat healthy. It is an epidemic crushing our great nation. Chris Boswell has only attempted 11 field goals this year because the Steelers prefer to score touchdowns. Antonio Brown no longer returns punts, but Ryan Switzer has returned 12 for more than 20 yards, fourth best in the league. Uh, Denver did release Adam Jones, who kept taking kickoffs out of the end zone despite never getting past the 15 fucking yard line. So I think that was a smart move. And I'm gonna give Denver a slight edge here because Brandon McManus with his new sweet clothing line also kicked a game winner twice last week. 0.25, Broncos. Broncos O-line and running backs versus Steelers front seven. Now talk about a nice surprise last week. I worried about that offensive line for no reason just like I'm doing right now with climate change. I'll be long dead before that kills me. Thank you, sugar and alcohol. Thank you so fucking much. Two starters and a starter's replacement all done for the season. And this O-line provided great protection for Case Keenum against the Chargers. It's like when your condom breaks, but you still don't get an STD or pregnant. Yes, that is the best analogy I can think of. The problem is that I think the Steelers' defensive line is more fertile than the Chargers. Been around the block a couple more times, a little loose, a little too promiscuous, if you will. Now I'd say just keep feeding Rolls-Royce and Philip Lindsay the ball, AKA life and insurance. If that nickname doesn't stick, I'm already dead. The problem is Jacksonville rushed it 43 times last week against the Steelers basically giving the Steelers a three-hour tutorial on how to stop the run and still win a football game. Red Dead Redemption had a three-hour tutorial as well, but I still don't know how to play that goddamn game. Hopefully, the same will happen for the Steelers. On that line, we know Cameron Hayward is the scariest guy named Cameron in human history, but Vernon Hargrave is playing pretty good football with Stefan Tuitt out with an injury, and then there's Tyson Alulu. 
who just, he just has a fun name to say. Edge rusher TJ Watt isn't his brother, but he's been effective the last two weeks. He basically has two to three sacks per game or just completely disappears. He's about one J short of greatness, as they say in Pittsburgh. Now I'll give the Steelers a slight edge. Even though I think their inside linebackers are just as questionable as Denver's, and I want to see another solid outing from this O-line before I go all in. 0.25 Steelers. Yep, Broncos ball catchers versus Steelers secondary. The Steelers defense is similar to the Broncos in that most of their talent is up front. The secondary has gotten better as the season has progressed, but they're still the weakest part of this team with the exception of Mike Hilton at corner and Sean Davis at safety. After that, you've got Joe Hayden, who can cover sometimes, but can tackle never, Cody Sensabaugh, Artie Burns, and Terrell Edmonds, all struggling like Bradley Roby, Tremaine Brock, and Justin Simmons in coverage. Which means this is all setting up to be a high-scoring game through the air from the looks of these two secondaries. Now it's too bad that Demarius Thomas isn't around anymore to do his traditional ass-kicking of the Steelers. It's one of the great traditions in sports, like Jim Nance giving out his tie at the NCAA championship or Ben Roethlisberger milking an injury when he's playing badly. Maybe former Steeler Emmanuel Sanders can pick up the slack and throw his second touchdown pass of the season. He's been quiet the last three weeks, zero TDs, and not a game with over 60 yards receiving. I have to call this position battle a wash. Not because I don't think the Broncos have more talent here, but because I saw Case Keenum light up the Chargers defense for 59 passing yards through three quarters last week. Zero points. Not that Roethlisberger was any better. Speaking of, Case Keenum versus Ben Roethlisberger. Here's some interesting stats nobody mentions about these two quarterbacks. Case Keenum is an Aquarius whose lucky day is Tuesday which explains his lack of luck on Sundays. Aquariuses are not very trustworthy and certainly not reliable when caught out there trying to chase an ideal. Ben Roethlisberger is a Pisces, of course. Of course he is. Astrological symbol, fish, slimy, just like Big Ben. They are often moody and act in childish ways, and they demand quite a lot from others, although they sure don't give back enough. These are uh, the same metrics Pro Football Focus and Next Gen Stats uses. The only quarterbacks Keenum has faced this year that uh, he was better than were rookies, Josh Rosen and Sam Darnold, who actually got the, vi the victory. Roethlisberger, by surface area and skill, is twice the quarterback Keenum is. I mean, when Ben Roethlisberger dives for the goal line, the officials actually give him the score. Unlike Case Keenum, who should have yelled in the ref's face after being unjustly accused of not scoring? If you exclude the three touchdown performance from week one, Keenum, in three Broncos victories, has thrown one touchdown and two picks. Those were during victories. Roethlisberger has 11 TDs in the last four games, matching Keenum's season total. All I want for Christmas is to see Case Keenum start throwing touchdowns like a real fucking quarterback. Advantage, Ben. Full point. Steelers. Now who has the point advantage? S Steelers? Don't give a shit because I'm picking the Broncos to win! That's right. That is right. Thanksgiving made me a little crazy. Every team faces a tipping point. And this is it for the current construct of the Broncos. This is Vance Joseph's ass. His smooth, beautiful ass. Case Keenum's ass. Not as smooth, somewhat meh, but still his ass, Joe Woods and Bill Musgrave's asses. It's everybody's asses. And don't get me wrong, Pittsburgh is definitely the better team. It's why they're three point favorites on the road, but sometimes you have to believe in something that's probably not real, like Santa Claus or Ben Roethlisberger's innocence. So today, with a lot of fear in my heart, a lot of worry about sounding and looking like a giant asshole dribbling dingleberries for predictions. I say Denver wins behind a high scoring, high scoring performance from the offense. 33-27 Broncos.
Thanks for watching another episode of That's Good Sports. Please, please subscribe here on YouTube. Will Keys, at Will Keys 6 and I do a podcast every Tuesday. It's on iTunes, Podbean, my second channel, That's Good Podcasts. It's called That's Good Sports Podcast. I'm on Twitter and Instagram, at Brandon Perna. Follow me if you want to know who I really am.